Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Judy and I love travel, history, and finding out about how people lived. Today I'm going to tell you the remarkable story about Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, shown here in a copy made of it shortly after it was completed, with colors quite at odds with how the painting appears today. Let's find out how it changed so much, why it was restored so many times, and how it managed to actually survive a direct hit from a 1943 Allied bomb run, which destroyed most of the church and the refectory which housed it, today on The Armchair Traveler. Meet Leonardo's Last Supper as it exists today. It is lovely, and you can see the faces and the hands and some of the details quite clearly, but compared with most of the paintings of the same time period, it is dreadfully washed out and not at all what I remember seeing earlier in pictures and in my art history book. There is no shortage of copies, copies from which modern conservators and restorers can draw their inspiration, but if I'm honest, none of the men who copied the original had Leonardo's skill. In addition, we need to keep in mind that they were working in oil paint, not tempera laid over white lead, as I'll explain in a minute, so the luminescence of the original has gone missing. The leopard was recognized as Leonardo's masterpiece, and a masterpiece of all painting from the very beginning. Historians tell us, however, that the painting began to deteriorate almost immediately after it was finished. The Dominicans didn't take very good care of it. That's why they punched a hole through the middle of Jesus' feet. Efforts have been made over the centuries to preserve, protect, repair, and generally fix it up. But enough hands have touched it that 20th century conservators were left with a hodgepodge. One of the biggest problems has always been that there were no photographs in those days. So all of the people working on this project from Jump had to work either from memory or in the earlier years from various copies. Sadly, the copies don't agree with one another. The first copy is by a man named Marco Di Giono. He was one of Leonardo's pupils and is known to have made copies of many of his works. The provenance suggests it was probably painted around 1506 or so, or less than a decade after Leonardo set down his brush, stepped step back, and pronounced himself satisfied. It is rich in details, including the coffered ceiling, which looks like wood, a tablecloth complete with wrinkles in the front, as well as some blue embroidery on each end, and that doesn't appear in any of the other versions I've seen. Marco gives us four trestles on the Apostles' feet as well. His colors robe are quite different from the Leonardo we see today. Where we see blue, he used green. Was that because malachite, which was used to make up that paint, was less expensive than ultramarine? It's certainly a possibility. Toward the mid-16th century, or around 50 years after the painting was first completed, everyone could see it was, it was deteriorating. An unknown artist did, however, put a replica of it in fresco format in the church of San Ambrogio in Ponte Capriasca. It was the first to include the names of the apostles beneath each of the figures, which we still use today. But for our purposes, afterward, its interest pretty much fizzled out. The ceiling is portrayed as wood coffering. All the versions agree with that, but quite red, which is almost certainly wrong. That could be an artifact of the camera resolution, or maybe the artist had access to red paint. The walls on either side of the room bear no resemblance to any of the other copies, and there are two windows in the back instead of three. I'll show you this final version, this time from the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, by an unknown artist with an equally unknown provenance and an unknown date, although some experts date it from around the middle of the 17th century. Perhaps one of the Tsarinas purchased it. Perhaps it was brought back from somewhere else as war booty. The artist generally follows the same outlines as our other versions, with the notable exception of adding halos above the apostle's head and greatly enriching the detail in the flooring, adding inlays to what almost certainly at the time would have been. I showed you in the introduction that the painting we see today barely resembles what we imagine the original might have looked like. The big problem here is there's no one left to tell us what it really did look like and disagreement even among people who make contemporary copies. They differ on the details, of course, but they differ even more on the colors and the use of perspective. So how did Leonardo handle the details? He left behind 20 verified paintings. There are plenty of more whose provenance is disputed, but they do provide us with some clues. Here are three examples, both religious and secular in nature. Although the subjects are very different, we can see that they do have techniques in common. The paintings left to right, the Salvador Mundi, the portrait of Ginevra de Benci, which I've seen in Washington, D.C., and an altarpiece called The Virgin on the Rocks. 
One thing they have in common is the extensive use of the color blue. We see it in Jesus' cloak, in the sky and the distinct mountains over the lady's left shoulder, as well as in the virgin, virgin's robe. In the Renaissance, true blue, which was sometimes called ultramarine blue, was five times more expensive than gold. Its color was derived from lapis lazuli, a rare, semi-precious stone mined almost exclusively to this day in Afghanistan and imported to Europe through Venice. Bright green, which also came from grinding down a stone, came from malachite, and it was also very expensive. Yellows, browns, and even oranges dominate the two copies we looked at were cheap. Does the missing blue in the copies mean that it wasn't there in the original? Or does it mean that the copyist declined to use it because it costs too much? It's not for me to say. Leonardo's use of light and dark to model the faces is evident in all three paintings, so that's a wash. How much Leonardo contributed to the Salvador Mundi, the painting on the left, is actually disputed. I think they can make the best argument for the face, chest, and hand, and that perhaps someone else did the rest of the work. Notice that the background, at least what I can make out from this photo, is completely dark. However, the backgrounds in the other two paintings are distinct and give us great samples of his use of perspective, as well as his tendency to include a lot of details. Can we make any certain conclusions enough to allow us to reconstruct the painting from scratch, aside from the fact that he was a fan of detailed backgrounds, used shadows extensively in his hands and faces, and really liked true blue? I don't think so. The easiest way to see Leonardo's masterpiece is to sign up for a tour. It's also the most practical since admission is extremely time limited and only a few people are allowed in to see it at a time. As a part of the tour, you also see the church and convent which surround it. This is Santa Maria della Grazia, which means Holy Mary of Grace. The church was commissioned by Francisco I Sforza, the Duke of Milan, who we met on our walking tour of Milan. The link is in the description box below. It took decades to build. Eventually, Ludovico Sforza, Francesco's son, decided to remodel and repurpose the church a little bit. The area where the Last Supper is displayed today was originally not a refectory. It was a mausoleum, and it was covered with paintings of all kinds, commissioned specifically to decorate it for the Sforza family. Ludovico hired Leonardo da Vinci, among others, to decorate the entire facility. We'll come back to Leonardo's process in a minute. Ludovico's wife Beatrice was actually buried here in the church in 1497. Eventually, the monks converted the mausoleum to a dining room, a high ceiling rectangular room which you visit today. It was probably at the time of that conversion that the monks decided to cut a hole in the wall and add a doorway, essentially obliterating the area underneath the table that would have shown us Jesus' feet, as well as the feet of several of the other apostles. If you have discerned that there is a lot of guesswork going on here, you are correct. The sad fact is that almost all of the records of the church and the convent were destroyed when the Allied forces bombed the area in August of 1943. The greatest damage to this complex occurred during World War II. The Italians were well aware, long before the country surrendered, that they were in the way not just of a mechanized Allied juggernaut rolling up the Italian peninsula and aerial attacks, including bomb runs, but also possible destruction by the Germans, who, after 1943, stopped being allies and began being occupiers. Like all nations likely to get in the way of either side, the Italians took steps to try to protect the painting. They faced the walls inside and out with what appears to be wood pilings and then faced the pilings several layers deep with sandbags, as you can see in this photo. The scheme worked, at least for the Last Supper. Unfortunately, it didn't work for most of the rest of the church. On the night of August 15, 1943, an Allied aerial bombardment hit the church and the convent. Much of the refectory was destroyed, but some walls survived, including the one with the Last Supper. The first photo I'm showing you gives you an idea of what the demolished cloister garden must have looked like sometime after August 1943. As you can see, significant parts of the building are simply gone. This later view of the refectory area and the dome is quite recent and shows you the redesigned and replanted gardens. These two photos were taken from nearly the same spot in the garden and give you a pretty good idea of how much damage occurred in this area during that Allied bombing run. Inside the church, there is a highly decorated main aisle, along with seven chapels along each of the side aisles. They were used by the most prominent families in Milan as a place of burial and private meditation and prayer. 
The interior was decorated with frescoes as well as paintings. One of them, painted by Titian and called Crowning of the Thorns, was used as an altarpiece in one of the chapels. As long ago as 1805, however, even churches were subject to despoliation by conquerors. The Titian altarpiece was stolen by Napoleon during the time he was in Milan, having himself crowned king of Italy, and at the same time his troops were using the refectory, or the monk's dining room, as a barracks, and the Leonardo for target practice. The damage to the refectory and even here in the main church has all been repaired, but the Titian? It's now exhibited in the Louvre, and the French clearly have no intention of returning it. The Leonardo is by no means the only artwork in the refectory which took a hit from that bomb run. Opposite the Leonardo, and in my personal experience, hardly anyone does more than take a glance at this, is a fresco by a Milanese artist named Giovanni Donato. It's about the same age as Leonardo's painting, but as you can see from this image, it has survived in far better condition. I was far more attracted to this piece of art. Despite there being a strictly limited number of people in the room, it was actually pretty hard to get a good look at the Leonardo. The crucifixion, on the other hand, is far more accessible. Like the Leonardo, it takes up an entire wall, although nobody thought to put a door in the middle of it. Leonardo, who was working at the same time, may even have had a hand in doing some of the faces in the crowd, including Duke Ludovico and his wife Beatrice. The fresco has survived the centuries in far better condition than the Last Supper. Each was subject to the same amount of damage from changes in temperature and humidity and the bomb run, and each was shored up in the same way. The big difference in the two is that the crucifixion was a fresco. Once those colors are applied to the plaster and the plaster cures, the colors are far more stable. Everyone has heard of this painting, even people like me who basically never got closer to an art course than a box of crayons. The Milanese also know that this is an enormous tourist draw, the third most visited site in the city after the cathedral and the gallery of Vittorio Emanuele. If you'd like to see those two sites, incidentally, check out my Milan city walking tour. The link is in the description box. An enormous amount of time, effort, and money have gone into restoring and protecting the painting. You go through the church and then you're shunted into a long corridor which looks out on the cloister garden, which you can see here. Eventually, you reach an airlock. Milan is said to be one of Europe's dirtiest cities, and this newly restored and repaired masterpiece, even if you don't agree with the restoration, faces challenges from possible further humidity, which is what damaged it in the first place, as well as the more modern scourge of air pollution. In 2009, the authorities installed a sophisticated heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system to protect it from the pollution, as well as exhaled breaths of too many people at one time. There's a system of light letting people know when they can enter the airlock and then the refectory, and someone on the inside to tell you when to leave. The number of people allowed in at one time is pretty small. I think it's only 15. This isn't like the Christ trying to see the Mona Lisa at the Louvre until recently when they began issuing timed entry tickets, or the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum, which as far as I know is still a free-for-all. There are rules here. What did the painting truly look like originally? Before I made my visit, the image that you see here was the painting I had in my mind, showing what it actually looked like in 1975, before the most recent restoration. It was in very poor condition. Among other things, the paint was falling off. What we don't know at all, and I don't think we ever will, is how good a representation this was of the original, since it incorporates plenty of color changes, at least in comparison with those early copies, and some details like parts of the coffered ceiling and to the wall on Jesus' right hand. I didn't follow the restoration controversy on this work at all, but I did follow the discussions of the, of the restoration of Michelangelo's fresco in the Sistine Chapel. I saw the work in both conditions, and while I understand people's love for the way it looked before it was cleaned, the fact is that the highly yellowed and somewhat dingy version then on view was not at all what Michelangelo intended. People complain about the bright, bold colors today, but that is what the man had in mind. Looking at The Last Supper today, again, I'm not at all confident that this is what Leonardo intended, although it certainly is possible. We've seen that it doesn't match up with the copies, with the colors in the early copies, but I think now that the copies were probably wrong. The clean version includes everything we see in this rather dilapidated ver version, as well as additional detail. Is it a perfect restoration? I doubt it. 
Will we ever know for sure? I doubt that as well. Among other things hampering the effort was the fact that virtually all of the church's records, even the ones telling us who was employed to take care of it over the centuries, disappeared when that World War II bomb dropped into it. So what we're left here is a consensus, a best guess, based on all the evidence that they were able to unearth or find. Was it a perfect reconstruction? That's not for me to say, or for anyone else for that matter. The beauty of art is everyone gets to make their own decisions. Thank you for joining me today to learn a little bit about Leonardo's masterpiece and how it changed over the last 500 years. Come back next time for another adventure with me here on The Armchair Traveler.